My guest has sung with major symphony orchestras and opera companies across the Americas and Europe. Singing, she says, is something she was born to do but didn't seek out. She says it found her. For more than 30 years, she has been the conductor of the University of Illinois Black Chorus. As professor of voice at the university, she's worked individually with many students, helping them develop their talents as she passes on what she has learned about surviving the rigors of a musical career. In 2008, she was named a university scholar. It's one of the highest honors the university can give to a faculty member. I'm very pleased to welcome two Illinois pioneers, Ollie Watts Davis. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here. This, the quote that I mentioned in the beginning, I pulled out of an, an interview that I saw that you did. And I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about that. And when, when you say, on the one hand, you feel you were born to sing, but that this wasn't something that you sought out. Tell me more about that. Certainly. I have been singing literally probably since I could talk, maybe before then, actually. Uh, grew up singing. My mother encouraged me to sing. My siblings encouraged me to sing. But I did not intend to seek music as a profession when I went to college. Mm -hmm. I went to West Virginia Institute of Technology. My brother was there studying engineering, and I thought I would do the same. So that's, I'm also interested that, that I, I saw you in one of the things I looked at, talking about the fact that you were interested in science and engineering, and in fact thought at one point that you might want to be an engineer or to study engineering. I did. I thought I would study engineering. He had a plan for us that perhaps we would have a partnership at some point. But I went to tech, as we called it, and um, joined the choir. The first semester, the choir went on tour, and I think I was hooked after that. I thought, this is absolutely wonderful. I could see myself doing this, singing and conducting. Mm -hmm. So is it when you were little, you sang because it was fun, because you enjoyed it. I think you said it was like a hobby, but never at that point did you ever think, well, maybe when I grow up, I could be a singer. Well, maybe a popular singer. Mm -hmm. I sang everything on the radio. I love the Jackson Five, Diana Ross and the Supremes. So it was for fun, and I thought maybe I could be a recording artist in that uh, um, way, mm -hmm. but I never thought about being a classical musician. I did sing in my high school choir, and really, my high school music teacher encouraged me uh, with music and music education. But I still thought that perhaps when I went to college, I would do something like computer science or some, some teaching uh, career or engineering, actually. Yeah. So you did. Yeah. Now, your, your undergraduate degree is in music education? Music education, right? yes. So at some point, you must have th thought, OK, engineering is not the way that I'm going. Music is really something that, that excites me, and how is it that you chose that then? As the, well, at my uh, college, we only had two options in music, music business or music education. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I would like to be a teacher as well. I mean, being a young girl, I was always sharing something with someone else and pretending I had a classroom, so I knew at some point I would be teaching. And so I chose the music education curriculum. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about the, the place that you grew up. This, this was a small town, for yes. sure. Yes, yes. I was born in Oak Hill, West Virginia, but I was raised in a small mining town called Mount Hope, West Virginia. And um, my mom was a stay-at-home mother. My father was a coal miner, but I was reared in a female-headed household. And I have uh, seven children in my family. I had uh, two older brothers and two older sisters and two younger brothers. And as I said before, I grew up singing whatever I heard on the, on the radio and television shows, and my mother always encouraged me to sing, and many times I uh, got to watch the show that I preferred on television because it was a musical show. Mm -hmm. My husband teases me to this day because I remind him that I did grow up watching Lawrence Welk. <laughs> <laughs> now, to the chagrin of my brothers who wanted to watch the sports, it doesn't, didn't matter if it was uh -huh. basketball or, uh -huh. um, or football or whatever, but if I got in front of the television first, I got to watch the show that I wanted to watch, and sometimes it was Lawrence Welk. Yeah. So you have uh, several uh, brothers and sisters, but nobody else in, in the family went into music as, as a career? No, I'm the only musician of the seven children. Yeah. And I think they all really enjoy it and appreciate it, but I think I'm the one who received the gift of music. Clearly, there have been a number of very important figures, mentor figures in your life. And as I read some of your story, I see that they're all women. 
and probably the, the, the number one, the one that you say was the most important of all, was your mother. Yes. Tell me about your mom. Well, she was a pretty intense lady, uh, had very high expectations for all of, our chil all of her children, all of us. And she really had one thing that was most important, uh, and that was she would ask us if we had done our very best. And so we were reared in a, in a household where we were expected to excel. It didn't matter what we chose, but we expected to do the very best that we could do in it. She was thrilled when I told her I was gonna study music. Mm -hmm. She was okay with the engineering path, but she didn't think that that's what I should be doing, but she didn't discourage me. But when I said, I think I'm going to study music and I'm gonna be a teacher, she was absolutely very, very happy. And when you were growing up, your your father lived in the town where you lived, and yes. you knew him, and you knew he was your dad. But you yeah. you didn't you your dad didn't live under the same roof. No, he didn't. He's a coal miner, and he supported us somewhat uh, somewhat financially. I was a cheerleader, if you can imagine that. Now being a professional singer, I was a cheerleader, and he would pay for me to go to cheerleading camp or for my uniforms or something like that. But it wasn't a daily uh, influence. Mm -hmm. As far as male figures. And, and role models or mentors, my brothers were, uh, played those, those roles in my life. Yeah. There, there's a, in a really nice story that I came across where you talked about um, the fact that now having been grown up and having a career and, and, and having a lot of success, you went back to the town where you had grown up and you gave a performance. And uh, that uh, one of your teachers apparently afterwards came up and w was literally in tears yes. and said, we had no idea that you had this talent. Certainly. Yeah, she was my um, eighth grade English teacher. And uh, I remember, and I remember that incident re really quite vividly. And I told her it was okay. You know, I didn't want her to feel bad that she had, had any sort of sense of guilt for having not nurtured me more or whatever. I thought she did a good job of teaching the classes I took from her. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling her, it's okay. My mother really knew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she knew even when I didn't know that we would become, all of our children would do something important. Well, I suppose that tells you a couple of things. One is that you never know what direction life is going to take, but the other is that perhaps with, uh, with singers, it takes some time for people's voice to develop and maybe you don't really know for some time. Well, you know, that's true. However, my high school music teacher, her name is Eunice Fleming, mm -hmm. she knew that I was a singer. And initially, David, I didn't even want to be in the choir. I played on the basketball team, I was a cheerleader, and I thought, you know, I like singing and I do it all the time, but you know, I don't know if I have time for the choir. But she encouraged me and uh, said, if you will just join the choir, I will uh, audition you to go and represent the choir, our high school, at the Allstate Choral Festival, which was really an honor. And so she thought that I always could do something special in music and encourage me yeah. with my music as well. She, now you, I, I want to hear more about her because this is a woman, she, <laughs> she taught geography, yes. music, she was also the basketball yes, coach. Yes, she was. Uh, so this was someone who, for you, again, in terms of you know, women that really influenced mm -hmm. you, this is someone who was very important. Very important, as, as you already alluded to. She was my uh, geography teacher in seventh grade. Uh, she taught me shorthand in the 10th and 11th grade. She was the basketball coach and the choir director. David, when she retired from teaching public school, they hired three people to do all the things that she had been doing. Pretty outstanding lady. She's now in her early 90s and she still keeps in touch with me and she wants to know all about what I'm doing and really a tremendous role model and mentor. Yeah. Well now, you know, having had women like that to serve as, as models and mentors, do you find yourself measuring yourself against them? I wouldn't say I measure myself against them, but I also believe that they showed me that I have a tremendous responsibility to share um, my gift, my talents, and to mm -hmm. also reach my potential. You know, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, and at least, I don't know if, if it's really important or not, but given the fact that I, that I know that you're a person of faith, and that's something that's mm -hmm. very important to you, and, and that uh, black sacred music is something that's very important yes. to you, in what I have read about you, I didn't see any mentions of you having sung in church. Oh my goodness, yes. I sang 
I sang in church yeah. a lot growing up. Mm -hmm. I sang, uh, I went to a church in Mount Hope called a Mount Hope First Baptist Church. I sang in the youth choir there, and I sang the hymns of the faith every Sunday. Uh, Mrs. Fleming, again, was mm -hmm. our choir director of the, at the church I attended. So uh, tell me about um, being in college and uh, at that point where you were thinking about now music being a, a career. How did it come about that this was in 1980 you came to the University of Illinois? Yes, this is a, a very special story that I'm really delighted to share. I was preparing in 1979 for a um, short recital at our cultural center in Charleston, West Virginia that was um, newly built and was opening. William Warfield was the guest artist that was brought in to actually open the season. Mm -hmm. And some of us uh, West Virginia natives, we were being featured in these smaller recitals. I was preparing for this performance and at a rehearsal, a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Charlotte Giles, uh, brought him to my rehearsal. And he walked into the, I was actually rehearsing in a church, and I saw him walking down the, you know, center aisle, and I wanted to stop singing and, you know, of course, acknowledge him and have a mm -hmm. conversation. And he, you know, indicated, no, no, keep rehearsing. And I did, and I was singing some German leader, and, and then I got to singing an aria from Porgy and Bess, and he starts singing along with me, and it was really special. After I finished rehearsing, um, I did go down and sat with him for a bit and visited, and he said, you should come to Illinois. And I thought, what a nice man. Mm -hmm. I had attended uh, a recital that he had done in Charleston a few years before that, and I thought that was so kind of him. He was so gracious, so inviting, and so warm. And I thought, you know, when I decide to go to graduate school, I may consider Illinois. That was so nice of him to invite me. Well, I didn't apply immediately after he said this, but Dr. Giles stayed on me and she would call me and she says, Ollie, have you written Uncle Bill? And that was, you know. I know, but yes, I know. <laughs> the name, people, I said, well, people all call them certainly. Uncle Bill. I said, well, Dr. Giles, that was so kind of him as I shared, you know, he probably tells everyone, she says, no, he thought you were really special. You should write him. And so I promised her that I would, and I did. And I, um, he had the S School of Music graduate office send me the application and different things, and I applied. And it was really interesting. I, I came out on a very wintry January uh, weekend to do my audition, and uh, he wasn't here. Hmm. He wasn't at the audition. And I'm thinking, I'm all the way here from home, and I, the person I know, or don't really know, but what I'm acquainted with, isn't he here. But um, I sang at any rate and uh, talked with the faculty afterwards and they uh, told me that there was something in my file that I need to send in and they were very pleasant, they were, they were very nice to me. But going back, my then fiance said, well, we probably should have stopped in Indiana and other places to audition. And I said, well, probably, but there seems to be something special about Illinois. Well. You know, uh, later I received a letter saying that I had been admitted to the graduate college and admitted to the school to start my graduate work and then was granted a fellowship to come and study. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, that's funny. I, I'm pleased to know that, it, that Bill Warfield had something to do with yes. you, you know, being here. And I certainly know how special I had the chance to meet and talk mm -hmm. with him a couple of times and he was a lovely man and I know how much his students loved him yes. uh, and how special he was. So. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to know that, that he really is the reason. That's a, yet another thing we have to thank Bill yes. Warfield for, yes. your being here. Yeah, he yeah. recruited me here and nurtured my time here. I did not study voice with him initially. He was on sabbatical when I came. I studied with a wonderful teacher, Grace Wilson, another female mentor. And I think that uh, subconsciously and oftentimes consciously, I want to teach in the spirit of Grace Wilson because mm -hmm. I learned so much from her her manner, her methodology, and uh, it was wonderful studying with her. Well, was it, when you came here to the university, was that really the first time that you, in a formal way, had a voice teacher and was, and was studying singing? That's correct. In undergraduate, I studied in a class situation for two years. It wasn't until my junior year that I started taking private lessons with the mm -hmm. teacher. Again, it was a small engineering school. We had one vocal person who taught 
voice lessons and he also conducted the choir. And so when I came here to Illinois, it was my first intensive um, time of studying voice. Hmm. And my very first time having a vocal coach and I had the privilege of working with John Wustman. Uh, well, uh, there's another story I want you to tell and that's actually the story of, of the, the moment when you really decided to stay because I think when you came to the university you were expecting, well, you'd maybe be mm -hmm. here for a couple of years sure. uh, and hadn't really intended to settle down in Champaign-Urbana. Sure. And I know that you were here and uh, had at that time, I think, a, a already had a couple of your mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So you had family and uh, had a husband who was at that time, I think, teaching, he was teaching music in the Champaign public schools, schools yes. public schools. Uh, so there was, there was a moment when you made a big decision and uh, because you had been planning on actually going back to where you had grown up. Well, I had been planning to, to return to West Virginia. Uh, well, at least, at least to West Virginia. Certainly. Yes. I did at the time have two children, my oldest two, Kirsty a daughter and my son Jonathan and I was expecting my third and I was invited to come to West Virginia University in Morgantown and to take a, a faculty position there on the, uh, on the School of Music faculty as a voice professor and uh, I thought that we would go, we would go back. We were thinking, you know, we came here for a couple of years for me to get my master's and but we're, we're from West Virginia so we should probably return and maybe this is our opportunity to go back and um, I remember actually being in church one Sunday morning and it was in August and we should, we'd gone out there and found a house that we could stay in and trying to make the move and I just had this feeling I knew that we weren't to go. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1984. And I remember telling my husband and he thought, oh dear, you're just probably not feeling well today. We've already signed <laughs> papers and you know, you know, you just need to, take a nap or <laughs> get some rest and you'll think about it, you know, whatever. But the next morning I called the director there in West Virginia and I said, I can't come. I just really feel led to stay here. Mm -hmm. And it was really providential. Uh, my husband then accepted his uh, call into the preaching ministry uh, that November of 84. My daughter was born on August 34th, I'm sorry, August 31st in, 80, in 84. And you know, you can say what you want, but I just knew that that was a gift to me from God that I had really heard him because my package, so to speak, at West Virginia University, all benefits, insurance, et cetera, was going to start September 1st. It would have been the day after. The day after, after you had I had, the baby. had Ashley. Uh -huh. And so, um, again, it was providential that we stay here. And uh, my husband, as I said, um, had a wonderful mentor uh, that helped him with in his new career mm -hmm. and then I could start my um, or basically complete my doctoral degree uh, without interruption so something else I, I, I want to make sure that I ask you about it that, that really struck me I, I spent some time looking at a book that you wrote the mm -hmm. book talks my mother never had with me um, and uh, there are a number of personal notes in there it's it's a little bit autobiographical. It's mm -hmm. not really your, ten, your purpose, I think, to write a memoir, but Certainly. I think you explain in the book that you felt that if you were going to be dispensing advice, you would have to also give away some personal, some personal information. You have to say something about yourself and your yes. experiences. So, and, and at one point you talk about how the fact that over the years, many students have come to you to, to do interviews, to ask you about who you are and your work and your growing up. And, and one particular interview, a, a student uh, came to you and you tell the story, and this was, I will say, she was a broadcast journalism student, that she started right off by asking you, how has being a woman of color held you back yes. personally and professionally? Mm -hmm. What was the answer that you gave? Well, I thought it was interesting that she would start with that question, um, but I told her that in no way had being a woman of color held me back. Actually, I believe that all that comprises me has benefited me. So being a woman of color, being a woman has been a great benefit for me, I believe. Um, it has helped me be who I am because it is who I am. And being a woman of color has also informed a lot of my decisions and has given me a passion that perhaps I wouldn't have had otherwise, um, but it hadn't held me back. And so I, 
was try was very gentle with her, but at the same time, I wanted her to um, understand that I valued being both, mm -hmm. and that I felt that both had been assets or are assets. Mm. In this book, you you talk about a lot of uh, a lot of different things. So the the idea of the book is here is is the kind of conversations a mother, or a a grown woman mm -hmm. would have with a younger woman, yes. talking about all all kinds of, of things, all aspects of, of growing up. And again, one of the things I guess that kind of struck me was that there was you know, some, some thought in there about, well, how do you think about success? What, is it, what does it mean to be successful in life? Mm -hmm. So if I asked you, you know, how for, for yourself, how you think about that, how you define what success means. How would you answer that? I have been given tremendous gifting and um, a lot of ability that I didn't work for. Um, I've just been blessed. I've been graced. And to be success for me is to have used those in the service of someone else, not just for myself, and to have been effective doing that. So it's not acquiring things or it's not prestige. It's really about have I done all that I can do with all that I have been given and has anyone benefited from that? And if I can say yes to that, then I think that I have, I have lived a successful life. So where do you think that this, this, this impulse to be of service comes from? Well, I think my faith informs it. I know my faith informs it. And then my upbringing informs it. Being a woman of color, being a woman, and being uh, from the African American uh, descent has informed that because service is so important. And the whole idea that if I do well, the community does well, and the community should benefit uh, from it as well. So I think that I'm fortunate because I've had that, I had that teaching coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about my older sister, uh, Linda, when she left home at 18 and moved to Washington, D.C., and she took a job working for the government. Every summer, she would come back and take one of us, one of the siblings, to Washington, D.C., those who were old enough to have a part-time job. They would work there, and she would show us around because she felt like, I've left West Virginia, I've left this situation that could be really limiting, and I want to get my family out of that situation and show each of my siblings that the world is a big place, mm. and there's something out there for you to do as well. So that idea of service has just been in my, in my upbringing, my but family. You, it, you also, it, it strikes me as being someone who, who also has a very strong personal drive uh, from wherever that comes. I, I also was really struck by something you said again in one of the interviews that I that I looked at, uh, and, and it's a very small quote, but I think it, that it's that it speaks volumes. Where you said something like, uh, you said in everything you do, you, or we said your advice say, say to students would be mm -hmm. in everything you do, be deliberate, yes. because you said you try. For, you're talking about singing. You uh -huh. try to make every note as beautiful as you can, even when you're rehearsing, yes. because it's a privilege to be able to sing that note. It is. I feel that way. I still do. And I think that that has helped me to sustain um, being able to sing well because I take it as an honor and tremendous opportunity and I try not to waste it. And in doing so, then I want to make sure that, you know, I've warmed up and I'm not being casual or haphazard with it. And I think that that is how I feel about how I've tried to live my life, pretty intentional on purpose, so to speak, and I believe that that is why I've been able to accomplish so many different things because there's been so much intent behind it. Yeah. Just maybe uh, one, one last thing, uh, because we're at the point where we, we, all, we all are going to have to stop. As I said a little bit earlier, clearly you, you're a person of faith. Your religious mm -hmm. faith is, is very important to you. For you, is singing a spiritual act? Definitely. Music is spiritual for me. I think music is going to last forever, and so we should be very, very um, deliberate, very intentional um, with what we sing, how we do it, what we say, because someone's going to be, um, it's going to outlive us. And so when I'm singing, it's pretty um, transcendent. 
Hmm. So it, well, tell me some <laughs> more about that. I, th I think I know what yeah. that means, but uh, to, you mean, when when you're on the stage, when, when you're singing stage, in front when of I, audience, even when I'm in my rehearsal and I'm focused in a way, and I recognize that this gift that I have, that I've developed, that I've worked hard, as you say, I've worked hard to develop this, but even that working and all of that does not uh, exceed the fact that I was given this gift and that I have taken care to develop it. And so when I can really be in the moment and be focused and think about what I'm saying and deliver that with integrity and honesty, it really is a transcendent experience for me. It's, it's like prayer. It's, it, it's like worship because I feel as if I'm outside of myself. I have the privilege of making this happen, but I'm also benefiting from it tremendously. Well, there we will have to stop. Thank you very much for talking with us. We appreciate it. And to you all, we also want to say thank you very much for watching, and we hope that you'll join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.